Um, so uh, I am talk going to talk about ACL surgery um, over the next 15 or 20 minutes. And um, I was thinking of, for a theme, what could I say about ACL surgery that would be interesting to a group of orthopedic surgeons is this is, you know, one of our most common sports medicine procedures. And so many of you are so familiar with it and, and experts in it yourselves. And so um, I decided I would just focus on kind of three concepts that are sort of hot topics today. Um, and I think what's interesting about each of these is that you'll see our running theme in which these are all, um, you know, improvements on something that has, has been done uh, in the past, really. Um, and so we're really uh, revisiting history for, for each of these and, um, and seeing if they'll work again if they didn't work once before. So, um, so just diving right in. So we'll talk about uh, ACL graft choice. Um, obviously, there are several options for auto and allograft. Um, I believe this should be old news to most of you, but um, the Moon study came out um, in the in 2011 um, in Sports Health um, with follow-up data following that, and really showed uh, the the two major predictors of graft failure after ACL reconstruction are age and graft type, specifically using an allograft. And so, um, you know, uh, odds of graft rupture with an allograft reconstruction are four times found to be four times higher than those of an autograft reconstruction. And, that really, when you com, uh, combine that with a young patient age can be um, very serious. And so uh, I would say that we, most of us at this point are using autographs on our younger patients. Um, besides follow-up studies from Moon, there are multiple other studies from different centers that have really confirmed this data, um, these data. And so um, uh, moving on to, you know, the, the next thought is what about BTD versus hamstring autograph? Um, and this is an, a newer study out of Moon that suggests that the BTB might be the, again, the, the go-to graft choice for this uh, young athlete high-risk group. Um, and so they saw that there was a two times higher risk of re-tear for the hamstring autograft compared to the uh, patellar tendon autograft. Um, and they actually have a risk calculator that they made based of all of their, their data in their um, uh, Moon cohort. Um, you plug you know, patient hypotheticals in on this website um, you can put out, uh, uh, the output will show you what the risk of a uh, re-tear would be if they were someone with a, a normal knee laxity versus high grade knee laxity. Um, and, uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, incorporates the marks activity score and other things that they found to be significant predictors in their cohort. But the new kid on the block that everyone seems to be talking about today for ACL reconstruction is the quad tendon autograft. Um, this is just some bar charts from PubMed showing the interest in publications on this. And, and again, these are not necessarily, uh, some, of, some of these touch on other concepts besides just the autograph, but you can see really the explosion in quad tendon research that has happened in the last few years alone compared to BTB and hamstring um, autographs. Um, and if you look at the data of uh, what percentage of ACL reconstructions are quad tendon, you know, it went from 3% in 2010 to 11% in 2014. And now we think it's closer to around 20% of autographs uh, that are going in our quad tendon. So why is everyone diving in here? Um, we know that there are limitations to the BTB um, autograph in the donor site morbidity, uh, particularly cited as kneeling or anterior knee pain, risks of patellar fracture or tendon rupture, and then also the, the dreaded graft tunnel mismatch where your graft might be too long for the tunnels that you drilled, and hence your bone would be sticking out of the um, tibia. Um, and then the, the uh, limitations for the hamstring autographs being that potentially greater laxity in that graft, uh, a final follow-up uh, potential for higher infection rate and uh, the limitation of the patient's own anatomy in the size or length of their hamstring tendons. And so the quad tendon, you know, it's thought to be a thick, uh, consistent graft diameter that can be obtained with perhaps more favorable um, tensile properties with load to failure testing. Um, and this is thought to be due to maybe uh, uh, improved collagen or fibroblast density as compared to the other types of autographs. Um, and then potentially a, a lower risk of donor site morbidity with more remaining tendon available after harvesting the graft. And this has become uh, also very popular in the pediatric population where people have been seeking a, a, a sturdier graft option that doesn't involve uh, bone blocks when you're worried about crossing the physes. What do the data tell us? Um, this is a, a nice meta-analysis, really compiling a lot of these comparative studies, retrospective and prospective, some case series. Um, uh, and, it, and it basically shows that the quad tenon is at least as good as the other autographs based on this these data, um, and potentially that there is less donor site pain. 
but I would caution again, I think that we're only starting to really understand the, um, the results of quad tendon autograph reconstruction. And um, it definitely doesn't have as long of a track record in the literature as our patellar tendon and hamstring autographs do. But what's interesting about it is it really isn't a new idea. Um, you know, if you go back to some of the earliest ACL reconstructions in the 1930s, uh, you know, Campbell of the Campbell Clinic was using quad tendon with his, um, well, also including a little bit of the patellar tendon in his autograft. And then um, Marshall um, also was a big proponent of Im implementing the quad tendon for the reconstruction um, uh, using, you know, some of the periosteum of the patella as well. Um, and then, you know, since the 1990s, Fulkerson has been a big proponent of the quad tendon in the U.S. and has been um, recommending its use. Um, you know, in terms of why the BTB rushed ahead of the quad tendon, uh, I'd be curious to hear the perspective of the audience, if anyone lived through this and, and understands it. But as far as I could tell, it seemed like there was just more data coming out and more people just gravitating to the, to the patellar tendon. And because they saw more papers showing good results there and there wasn't as much published on the quad tendon. Um, and some studies on the quad tendon uh, suggested that potentially there was less quadricep muscle strength postoperatively when people recovered, um, although that hasn't been borne out as true in the more modern literature. And so I think, again, uh, remains to be seen what the, the newer outcomes are going to show now that we have better technology of how we're drilling and inserting these graphs. Some cautions with this though, uh, there still are donor site issues, a hematoma being a big one because of the robust blood supply in that area. Um, and then there was a, you know, a registry study um, uh, that suggested that the quad tendon um, revision rate was higher than seen in the other autograph types. This is the only study that I've seen so far that's really shown this. And uh, I do think there's a bit of an asterisk on this data and that the, um, the quad tendon group was really small compared to the other autograph groups. And so um, it, it's hard to interpret the, these registry data, but um, at least uh, exercise some caution in, in use of this graph, but um, certainly becoming more and more popular and we'll hear a lot more about it, I'm sure, in the years that come. Moving on to the LET, so the lateral extraarticular tenodesis, what is it? Um, so it's taking a strip of the IT band and uh, rerouting it under the LCL and plugging it into the femur. Um, alternatively, you can also do an actual reconstruction in this area using an allograft. Um, and it's seen as a possible solution to what many of us find after ACL reconstruction, which is that there could be a little bit of residual pivot shift that we've gotten really good at restoring the Lachman, but the pivot shift remains a little bit of a mystery. Uh, renewed attention to the anterior lateral ligament in the last uh, five to 10 years has really uh, uh, also helped create a lot of in renewed interest in the LET as an option for ACL surgery. Um, and um, there are biomechanical studies that support the function of the ALL, which is really a thickening of the capsule in this area um, in terms of the rotatory stability and supporting the function of the ACL. What are the outcomes of the LET? Um, if you did your uh, ABOS WLA this year, you might have seen this article, which was a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials um, looking at the LET for ACL reconstruction. And what they found is that uh, indeed uh, supplementing the ACL reconstruction with the LET la favored uh, decreased a uh, positive pivot shift in patients, although no change in the Lachman, as one would expect. And then in terms of graft re-rupture, there was a lower risk of graft re-rupture in the um, group with that would be combined ACL and LET. Um, and they found this to be three times less likely. The concept of the LET and the ALL is definitely not new though. So, uh, you know, looking all the way back into the late 1800s, Paul Sagan wrote about, um, you know, his famous uh, Sagan lesion, um, which he talked about before even x-rays were invented, um, but it's basically that fleck of bone that is the attachment of the ALL to the tibia there. Um, and there were certainly a number of extra articular reconstructions that were advocated for ACL tears as, you know, in this era of open surgery where people didn't want to enter the joint as, you know, you could lead to things like septic arthritis and arthrofibrosis. Surgeons were looking for other ways to reconstruct and restore the stability um, of the knee that the ACL, the torn ACL had provided. And so these were just some examples of extra articular reconstructions. Pos probably the most well-known though is the Lemaire um, technique, which was initially published in the late 1960s. 
Um, and this is really the modern LAT is it, for most people is just a modification of this. Um, and where instead of taking as long of a strip of IT band as Lamera discussed, um, we take about half that length because we're not like, doubling it back on top of itself. Um, and then also looking, you know, at Canada, Macintosh also was was talking about this lateral substitution reconstruction, which is essentially the, the same thing, um, and and also had a second procedure procedure called the Macintosh two, where it combined with an intraarticular over the top loop to restore the intraarticular um, stability as well. And then a whole bunch of other extraarticular reconstructions uh, came out in the same era with people really just looking at different ways to do the same thing. Um, I thought this quote from um, Dr. Ellison was uh, enlightening and that the, uh, and sort of shows the thinking of the time, which is that the ACL is located virtually at the axis or pivot of the knee. And as such, it is at the hub of the wheel. It is easier to control the rotation of a wheel at its rim than at its hub. So why didn't this all catch on right away um, after this point? Um, there were some studies suggesting that doing an isolated um, uh, LET on the knee did not restore stability, particularly in your higher grade um, Lachman, um, because, and it makes sense when you think about what it, where it is restraining. Um, and there are other papers also showing that um, the isolated LET did not have um, a, offer good stability. And then furthermore, like in the 80s, you know, we had arthroscopy came about and we got really excited about our ability to do minimally invasive uh, intraarticular procedures. And so the arthroscopic assisted ACL just took over uh, and as the data showed that it um, restored the stability of the Lachman very well and very consistently. So these sort of LET extraarticular procedures really faded um, uh, in favor of the more isolated intraarticular. And now we've just sort of cycled back to the idea again as we're realizing the limitations of what we're able to do in the joint sometimes. Word of caution on the LET though, again, is there's this possibility of over constraint. Um, there are a number of recent biomechanical studies that show that this uh, may be creating too much of a restraint on the um, lateral knee, um, although the clinical significance of this is yet unknown. So are we creating a, a possibility for these patients to get earlier onset lateral arthritis um, to, to be determined, but uh, just something to, to be aware of, and, and perhaps we'll see more of that in the future. But I think the LET remains a really um, nice option for patients who may have a higher degree of severity pivot shift or higher risk of graft rupture after ACL reconstruction. So finally, let's touch on ACL repair. Um, so gosh, why are we talking about ACL repair? Well, I think it'll be clear in a moment, but this was one of our earliest ways of trying to treat ACL surgery. And in fact, the first ACL repair was back in 1895, which was like really in the infancies of modern surgery at all, because this is you know, when all of these, these more um, modern concepts of uh, anesthetics and asepsis all came out. This was continued through the 1900s. Um, O'Donohue, uh, the famous Dr. O'Donohue talked about his outcomes with ACL re repair, um, talking about, about it as being surgically feasible and highly successful if done early. And then um, Dr. Marshall, uh, also a very um, influential sports medicine surgeon, discussed the good outcomes that he had with ACL repair on his patients. Again, all these were case series um, and there were um, ACL then repair then, however, came under a, a fair amount of attack uh, as other studies showed that it wasn't performing as well as other studies and so, or as other, uh, as the reconstruction. And so this is a study by uh, John Fagan um, looking at military recruits showing actually pretty poor results in how they did with ACL repair. And then this uh, study by Lars Enger, Enger Britson um, demonstrated, uh, you know, when comparing the VTB reconstruction to the Kennedy LED uh, augmentation to the ACL repair, that the ACL repair did really poorly um, compared to the other two groups. And so this really was sort of like the nail in the coffin for ACL repair. And people really shifted away from this towards more um, uh, reconstruction after this. If you're wondering what the Kennedy LAD was, this, it was this polypropylene ligament augmentation device that is uh, also since um, fallen by the wayside as people have seen problems with this. So why are we talking about ACL repair? It's because there's this new device out called the um, Bear implant, which you may have heard of, um, bridge enhanced ACL restoration. And the idea is in addition to sewing the ACL back together, now we put a piece of PRP is soaked sponge basically around it. It's something, something to induce the healing response of that ligament. 
Um, and so if you go to their website, you can look at the technique of how they recommend to do it and, and all of the, the great things they say it does. Um, there is a recent trial. Um, so the reason it's approved now is because this trial came out showing that at least for a non-inferiority study, it performed about the same as BTB reconstruction. However, it was powered for IKDC. Um, and one thing that I would note of caution I note is in the results, they report, you know, 14% re-injury in their bear group versus 6% in the ACL group. Um, and so although this wasn't statistically significant, that might've been a result of being underpowered. So phase three trials are currently underway, one within Moon and one outside of Moon. Um, and so I'm sure we are gonna hear a lot more about the bear in the years to come, um, but interesting that it, we are again, revisiting an older concept. So in conclusion, I think, you know, the modern techniques and trends and hot topics in ACL surgery all have these interesting foundations in history. Um, and time will tell, really tell how these new techniques hold up in terms of using the quad tendon as a graft, uh, LAT, um, and the uh, bridge enhanced ACL uh, restoration. Thank you very much. Well, um, yeah, this was fantastic. Again, just like Matthew before, a incredible uh, journey through ACL reconstruction from past to present and to even future. Uh, with a tremendous scope of intra and extra articular options. My question to you is, as you're facing an athlete, aside from age, uh, are, how do patient factors and sports uh, weigh into a decision? Specifically, let's say somebody who is in a final contract and needs to get out in the field as soon as possible. A so linebacker does not need to cut and uh, uh, twist too much. Does that change your angle? Would you even consider an allograft, a really beefy allograft in that? And again, then uh, look at that, uh, compare that with a young female athlete who twisted her knee. She has a tight femoral notch, I'm not sure that matters still. And she has a collegiate career, but she has maybe a year to give. So position and sports specific, body physiology specific factors. How much is that risk score a factor? How much is just your intuition or the patient preference of getting back on the field versus I'm going to rehab this out a factor? Yeah, that's a, a great question. You know, when we look at the, the young athlete, I think um, most people would agree that that surgery is recommended at this point in order to, uh, uh, given the highest likelihood of returning to sport, although we know it's not 100%. And a lot of times there's factors outside of just the success of the surgery that go into that. In terms of specifics of the sport and what graft to use, um, I, my personal philosophy is that, that I, you know, I, I, I gravitate towards the BTV. That's my kind of go-to for that athlete, for the athlete group in general with very minor nuances, potentially like if I'm concerned about kneeling pain or impact of the patella on the ground as being something that may bother them, I may just discuss that and talk about, you know, the quad or, you know, the hamstring as other options, but I'm almost uh, never putting in allografts in, in athletes anymore. Um, just, I just am a firm believer in that, the, that moon study and the, the data that they presented there. Um, but I, I know that the other people have different philosophies on it. And like I said, the quad tendon has, been, has recently shown a really nice track record. And so um, a lot of people are gravitating towards that for their athletes as well. A, a great answer. And one final quick question, and that is proprioception seems to be such a big deal. Is that eternally lost after an ACL tear, regardless of the reconstruction technique, or can you train that back on again? A big part of the recovery after ACL surgery is how to, how, how can we retrain the knee and, and prevent re-injury? Um, and you're right. I, th I think that, that, that it, it is tricky, but we certainly get people back to, um, near pretty close to, to normal activity levels. And, and, um, if you look at, again, the, the follow-up data, even at 10 years. And so it involves a lot of patient dedication, um, to, to their physical therapy and to their, um, retraining of their mechanics. But, uh, but there is, the, the, and this is why, again, we're visiting things like the LET, because there's something about the kinematics of the knee that does change after ACL reconstruction. We haven't gotten it totally right yet. Um, and so, you know, it's, again, we're striving for getting them exactly the way they were before they were injured. And it's, it's hard. Really cool perspectives. And uh, thank you for doing that. We'll use that as a resource for ACL decision-making.